is the tenth lecture on digital signal processing, and we continue our discussion on DFT. In the last lecture, we discussed the symmetry relations for Fourier transform. We discussed the concept behind DFT. What is the concept? N number of pieces of information in the time domain and therefore n number of pieces of information in the frequency domain should be adequate and this n are usually obtained by sampling the Fourier transform at capital n number of points <coughs> evenly spaced that is uniform sampling. We also stated the formulas for DFT and IDFT and emphasized that one follows from the other. The two are not independent of each other because DFT as well as FT are one to one transformation. We sketched the proof of IDFT and we gave examples of delta N, delta N minus M and cosine of twice R pi N by N. Then he said that DFT is useful and important because of FFT which itself is not a new transformation. It is an algorithm for computation of DFT. Then he said if the samples in the frequency domain capital N number of samples are given that is if X, capital X of K are given how to find the total spectrum capital X of E to the J omega and that is obtained by the so called interpolation. The formula does not look very nice, but it can be programmed and then you can rapidly compute the in between samples of DFT. We also made a matrix <coughs> representation and that is very important. Although it looks like a mathematical representation only, we showed that capital X vector is simply d n which is an n by n square matrix small x where the entries in d n the first row is all one, the first column is all one and then you have powers of w n. And we also showed that the inverse d f t can be written as d n star capital X 1 by N. Okay. These matrix representations we shall demonstrate today how these are useful. One point that I wish to emphasize here is that if capital X of K N number of points are given and you want a denser representation, you want the in between samples, you can do it by interpolation. You can compute from the interpolation formula. You can also do it differently using DFT only. Suppose your X of N exists from N equal to 0 to N minus 1 and you wish to compute X of K for k equal to 0 to no not that k equal to 0 to n minus 1 this is the usual DFT. But suppose you want to compute x of k not at twice pi by n intervals but at smaller intervals that is what we mean by interpolation. Suppose we make instead of capital N we make capital M we want to where capital M is much greater than N. If N is <coughs> 128, maybe you wish to compute at 1024 points, capital M may be 1024. Then it will be a very dense representation and the, and the envelope shall represent almost accurately capital X of E to the J omega. What you can do is the alternative is which is sometimes preferable if you have an FFT algorithm and increasing the number of points is not a problem, what you do is you, you pad capital 
you pad the necessary number of zeros to x of n such that its length becomes capital M. Agreed? You have x 0, x n minus 1, then you pad 0, 0, 0, 0 up to m minus 1. Take this sequence instead of the original sequence that there that you have padded a sufficient number of zeros also simplifies the computation because the zero multiplied by anything is zero. But if you compute the m point dft of this sequence of this extended sequence then you shall get samples at intervals of twice pi by m. Agreed? So, this is an alternative method for doing this. You either use interpolation or you or you artificially extend the length of the sequence by adding zeros all right, and then compute capital M point DFT. Uh, <coughs> then we go to DFT properties. Once again, the proofs shall be left to you, but I shall explain while discussing the properties what their import or significance is and how to derive them. So, we use these two sequences g of n and h of n whose DFT capital N point DFT are capital G of k and h of k. The first property as is true about all transformations is linearity that is alpha g of n plus beta h of n shall give you alpha capital G of k plus beta h of k. Now, <coughs> In ordinary Fourier transforms, you we showed that if the sample, if the sequence is delayed, then the output transform is multiplied by a factor. If the sequence is delayed in ordinary Fourier transform, if the sequence is delayed by one sample, then the output is multiplied by e to the j e to the j e to the minus j omega ok. N 0 samples then e to the minus j n 0 omega. Here if you have a sample between 0 and n minus 1 and you delay it by one sample then you go out of the range of vision and therefore you have to define some other kind of delay and some other kind of shift such that even after the shift the sequence remains in the range of vision all right. So, what you do is you define what is called circular shift. Let us understand how circular shift occurs. It is like a, <coughs> a circle along which a group of people are sitting and one shifts to the right or to the left. Then the last one comes and occupies the vacant position. This is circular shift, but I shall explain this with the help of a figure. The figure that I have prepared is the following. I will project it by parts. Look at this diagram. I have taken a very simple, simple sequence of length 4, x0, x1, x2, x3. These are arbitrary amplitudes. Okay. What I do is I draw a circle. This is why this is why the name circular shift comes. I draw a circle and put them at equal intervals. They are at equal intervals. So I divide this into four equal parts: x0, x1, x2, x3 and the shift that we are talking of is clockwise shift. Shift to the right shall mean clockwise shift. 
Now if I shift this sequence by one sample then x0 will come in the position of 1, x1 will come in 2, x2 will come here then x3 will go to 4. So it, it turns back and occupies the vacant position. This is what we mean by circular shift and the successive diagrams will show delay by one sample. Delay by one sample if you put n equal to 0 here, now let us go to the mathematics. If the idea is clear then the mathematics is that n minus 1 if n equal to 0 it becomes x of minus 1. Then you take it modulo 4 that is add 4 to it x of 4 minus 1 is x 3 so x 3 comes here and then the other 3 sequences shifted by 1. So in terms of circular shift x 0 goes to this position this position and so x 3 is driven out of this to occupy the vacant position agree. This is what we mean by circular shift second <coughs> Second example n minus 2 delayed by 2 samples so x0 and x1 come here and the other 2 positions you see it is 1 sample delay on this. So x0 comes here x1 then x2 goes here and x3 goes here no position is vacant our range of vision is still from 0 to 3 agreed. Otherwise DFT does not make sense. DFT freezes the range of vision to 0 to capital N minus 1 and finally <coughs> x of N minus 3 modulo 4 is simply x of you add you add 4 to it N so it is x of N plus 1 modulo 4 and if you calculate the samples this will be the picture. In terms of the circle it is <coughs> more easily visualized in terms of a circle well x0 comes here there are 3 samples of delay so x0 was here 1, 2, 3 and then they go in a merry go round fashion ok. Circular shift. <coughs> These equations? Yes. One shift because it shifts beyond the range of vision we take modulo the number of samples modulo 4. So x of minus 1 for example is the same as x of 3. Similarly here if you put n equal to 0 x of minus 3 is the same as x of 1 that is what I have written. So the shift is now a modular shift or a circular shift the argument has to be taken modulo 4 then your range of vision shall remain frozen between 0 and and 3 ok 0 and 3. <coughs> so if you make a circular time shift that is if you shift n0 <coughs> what are the possible values of n0? n0 must remain within the range of vision ok. So you take modulo n then the uh, dft shall be wn raised to the power k n0 g of k. <coughs> if you have a circular frequency shift that is you have wn raised to the power minus k0 n multiplied by g of n. You multiply by an exponential then the, uh, the dft simply becomes g of k minus k0 it follows from the definition modulo n agreed. Then comes convolution you know in linear convolution if you take the convolution of n samples with another sequence also having n samples the total length of the linear convolution shall be 2n minus 1 agreed. In circular in DFT applications your range of vision has to be restricted to 0 to 
n minus 1 you cannot go beyond that and therefore you have to define what is called circular convolution sometimes also called periodic convolution periodic convolution is <coughs> gm h of n minus m but when you take n minus m you have to take modulo n then you make sure that the range of vision shall be restricted between 0 and n minus 1. The shift has to be a circular shift. m goes from 0 to n minus 1, capital N minus 1. Then the, <coughs> then the DFT shall be simply the sum of them. So, circular convolution gives rise to a multiplication in the frequency domain exactly like either Laplace transform or Fourier transform, okay, circular convolution. Then corresponding to modulation property of Fourier transform, we have here g of n, h of n and in Fourier transform it was an integration, here it shall be a summation because the inverse DFT is also a summation. In the previous case it was integration and <coughs> The value is the Fourier transform is 1 over n g of m h of k minus m but modulo n and then m goes from 0 to n minus 1 all right. This clearly is a convolution but a circular convolution it has to be brought in mind what it imposes on the mechanics of convolution we shall illustrate with a few interesting diagrams. Finally, the Percival's relation for energy is also valid here, Percival's relation that is the energy in the time domain x of n squared n equal to 0 to n minus 1 is exactly equal to 1 by n summation x k magnitude square k goes from 0 to n minus 1. The energy in the time domain is the same as the energy in the frequency domain. In Fourier transform this involved an integration here it is a summation. So, DFT makes life simple you do not have to integrate it is all summation and mechanization in the computer is much easier in any case if you have to compute Fourier transform by a computer you shall have to make grids you shall have to compute digital computer only understands intervals it cannot compute a continuum of variable okay. So, DFT makes life simple in applications of DSP to practical problems. Now, let us understand what we mean by circular convolution. circular convolution. <coughs> we uh, if we have two sequences g of n and h of n then the linear convolution let us call it y l of n linear convolution which we denote by by a star is simply given by g of m h of n minus m this linear convolution m goes from 0 to n minus 1 because they are finite sequences of length capital N and y l n has to be computed from n equal to 0 1 up to up to twice m minus 2. <laughs> this is why I was pausing the length has to be 2 m minus 1. So, the last sample must have an index of 2 m minus 2 this is linear convolution. Circular convolution on the other hand which you denote by a subscript C is written to emphasize that it is n point and that it is a circular convolution we simply instead of a star we simply include n within a circle g of n circular convolution h of n is 
by definition equal to g of m h of n minus m modulo n m goes from 0 to capital N minus 1. Okay. To understand this a little more deeply, let us consider a simple example. Let us take two four point sequences. The number of points has to be the same in circular convolution. This is not necessarily true in linear convolution. You can have an arbitrary number of points. But in circular convolution, your number of points have to be the same. The example that we take is g of n is 1, 2, 0, 1, 4 samples and this is n equal to 0. The arrow shall indicate n equal to 0. h of n is also a 4 point and the samples are 2, 2, 1 and 1. Now let us see what circular convolution means. First we will show it, we will do this in, in, a, in three or four different manners. Then you make your choice, whichever appears simple to you. I have prepared a slide. <coughs> Pardon me? Ah, this is H and 0. It has to be the same, the last sample must be N minus 1. Okay. Now <coughs> look at this slide carefully. I'll project it in parts, in steps. Let me use a different color. Green. <coughs> Green is supposed to be a go signal. Uh, <laughs> I have indicated M here, 0, 1, 2, 3. G of M here, 1, 2, 0, 1. H of M is 2, 2, 1, 1. So far, so good. Now, I have to find out H of minus M. Then, shift it by one sample at each step. Now, h of minus m, if I do this, then this part will flip back. In other words, we shall start from minus 3. We can't do that. We must start from 0. So, we take h of minus m modulo 4, h of minus m modulo 4, which means that 0 comes here. 0 is 0, but 1, when you get minus 1, it would be 4 minus 1, that is 3. So, x3, 1, this 1 comes here. I have indicated by an arrow. Then, h of minus 2 is the same as h of 2. So, this 1 comes here directly. And, h of minus 3 is the same as h of 1 and therefore, this comes here. Agreed? Is this clear? I have taken modulo 4. So, that my range of vision is 0. 2, 3. Then at this point, since n is equal to 0, if you recall the summation, what was the summation? g of m, h of n minus m, m equal to 0 to n minus 1. If you recall the summation, then for n equal to 0, this is my y c of n. For n equal to 0, I have h of minus m. h of minus m is already here. And therefore, I can multiply sample by sample and add them. Multiply 1 by 2, 1 by 2, then 2 by 1, 2 by 1, 0 by 1, that is 0, and then 1 by 2, 1 into 2, and the sum is 6. I have calculated yc of 0. See what happens next. I have to find h of 1 minus m. 1 minus m means the whole sequence is shifted to the right by one sample and the last sample runs back to occupy the vacant position. So, 2 goes here, 1 goes here, 1 goes here and this 2, this running back I have indicated by this arrow. Agreed? Since you have found out h of 1 minus m, n is equal to 1, therefore you can calculate y c of 1. What you do is? 1 multiplied by 2, 1 multiplied by 2, 2 multiplied by 2, 2 multiplied by 2, 0 multiplied by 1 okay, and 1 multiplied by 1. Sum them up, the sum is 7. 
this process continues for another two steps. We have already found out two samples, another two samples have to be found. So H of 2 minus M, you see the pattern repeats, this comes here, this comes here, this comes here and this one goes back to the 0th position. So I now multiply this sequence by this sequence, 1 times 1, 2 times 2, 2 times 2, then 0 times 2 and 1 times 1, the sum is 6. Finally, the last sample, once you do the first step, then the other steps are very simple. All you have to do is to repeat this arrow pattern. You see this arrow pattern is the same as this arrow pattern, same as this arrow pattern. 1 comes here, 2, 2, 1. And then you multiply this sequence by this sequence. 1 times 1, 2 times 1, 0 times 2, 1 times 2 and the sum is 5. And therefore, finally, my yc of n, yc of n becomes 6, 7, 6, 5, 4 samples. That is what I wanted, okay. All right. Do not worry if you have not been able to take it down. I have prepared some copies which I shall distribute at the end of the class. How do we mechanize this? Well, I gave you um, for linear convolution, didn't I? A dear trick. Some of my students write my name like this. <coughs> There should be a mechanization here also. You see this is very simple. Uh, <clears throat> you have to follow this carefully. It is not in the book. The trick is the following. I should take it. Let me explain in steps. Let us see. How do we mechanize this? Without going through the graphical computation, can you do it mechanically? <clears throat> Well, what we do is the following. I have written M, G of M and H of M and I have identified which are G0 and H of 0. This is important, okay. I should be able to keep track of which sample will be what. Then what I do is, what I do is I do the same thing as I did in linear convolution. That is I multiply 1 by 1, exactly like arithmetic multiplication. So, 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 0 is 0, 1 times 2 is 2, 1 times 1 is 1. This is the first step. In the second step, if you recall, in arithmetic multiplication or linear convolution, we had left this place vacant. We leave it vacant now also. So, we put a dash here. We put a dash here and then, and then go for the second one, 1. 1 times 1 is 1, 0, 1 times 2 is 2, then 1 times 1 is 1, we do not write it to the left. It runs and occupies the vacant position, all right. So we carry, we continue this. The, in the next step, we leave two vacant places, right. Then we multiply by 2, 2 times 1 is 2 here, these two are vacant, okay. 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 0 is 2. Then 2 times 2 is 4, 4 runs and occupies the first available vacant position, all right. Then 2 times 1, well it sees this field, so it goes to the next one, 2, agreed. You see that we have only created 4 samples in each step. Then the last one, last one is uh, you leave 3 vacant spaces and 2 times 1 is 2. Then 2 times 0 is 0, 0 occupies here. 2 times 2 is 4, it comes here. 2 times 1 is 2. Then you add them. You add them. Now there is a problem. It becomes 5, 6, 7, 6. Our result was 6, 7, 6, 5. So you must identify which one is the 0th sample. Then the rest will be clear, okay. You, you recall that this was G0 and this is H0. Where does the product Z0, H0 occur? The sum of the indices should be equal to the index of the output sample, okay. Where does G0, H0 occur? This is the one. In the last step, in the last step, we had created 3 vacancies. 
right and then we we went like this 2 times 1 2 times 0 2 times 2 2 times 1 this comes here so identify where is g0 h0 this column will give you y sub c of 0 okay so 6 then the next one will be 1 next one will be 2 and then since there is no more you go back and find out the third sample once you identify this one then the problem is solved well suppose you have made a mistake in identifying this how do you verify well go back to the to the first sample here first product what is this this is a multiplication of g3 and h3 the sum of the indices should be equal to the index of the output now 3 plus 3 is 6 we do not have a 6 sample but 6 modulo 4 is 2 so this must be yc of 2 do you understand this so you can verify whether you have done it correctly or not all right I have an extra slide which I will give you at the end of the class <coughs> Now, um, as I told you, we can uh, compute circular convolution by various other methods. And one of the methods is that you find g of k, you find h of k, multiply the two, then take i d f t of this. This is one of the methods. Let us see, we will compute the same example by this method no I do not have a slide our uh, sequences are g of n is 1 2 0 1 and h of n is equal to 2 2 1 1 <coughs> understood that the first sample is the 0th sample and the last one is the third sample 0 1 2 3 now g of k let us understand well uh, the definition is that uh, <coughs> g of k shall be g of n w n raised to the power n k n will go from 0 to 3 w n this n is 4 now let us see what is w 4 e to the power minus j 2 pi by 4 and therefore this is equal to e to the power minus j pi by 2 and that is equal to minus j agreed so I can write this g0 is 1 1 plus if I put k equal to 0 k equal to 0 well let us write the general formula this will be minus j to the power k okay I am not calculating g1 I am calculating gk so we get g0 multiplied by w4 to the power 0 I keep k as a variable plus g1 minus j to the power k plus g2 minus j to the power 2k plus g3 minus j to the power 3k all right so you find out you put values of k k equal to 0 k equal to 0 means it will be the sum of all this k equal to 1 k equal to 2 k equal to 3 I have actually carried this out and the result I leave this algebra to you do not make a mistake in powers of j and minus j minus j whole squared is minus 1 plus j whole squared is also minus 1 okay do not make a mistake my result is please do verify whether I am right or wrong my result is gk is 4 1 minus j minus 2 1 plus j and in a similar manner I calculate HK HK is 6 1 minus J 0 1 plus J so the product GK HK 
shall be the corresponding samples multiplied 24 what is 1 minus j whole squared minus 2j what is minus 2 multiplied by 0 well that's 0 and 1 plus j whole squared is plus 2j and then y c of n shall be the idft of this that is one fourth summation k equal to 0 to 3 all right g k h k multiplied by minus j it's the same is it minus j or plus j plus j the power is negative so it is plus j to the power n k agreed now you expand this this will be one quarter the first sample is 24 then j to the power n is 0 I am sorry k is 0 so j to the power 0 is 1 minus 2 j j to the power n <laughs> we are computing y c of n then plus 0 we ignore plus 2 j j to the power 3 n so you put n equal to 0 n equal to 1 n equal to 2 and n equal to 3 and compute the sequence once again be careful about the powers of j they are very elusive the final result that I get please do verify I get y c of n as equal to 6 7 6 5 as expected it has to be so I have given you three methods one is graphical one is strict third is multiplication of g k by h k and taking inverse dft now this is where the matrix representation comes to help you see if I want to find out g of k and h of k we found out by writing the summation and multiplying and finding out each sample multiplying sample by sample and then taking the inverse now I could do this in a very simple manner if I find what is d4 all right d4 will occur in finding gk in finding hk and also in finding the inverse dft because gk hk is also of length 4 agreed so d4 one matrix is good enough the rows are the first row is 1 first column is also 1 then you have w n to the power 1 what was w4 minus j the next one would be minus j squared so minus 1 then minus j whole cube that is the product of this would be plus j you see we can't make a mistake here it's very it's very uh, easy to do this instead of writing in the summation form then the uh, the next one this will be minus j squared so it will be minus 1 right then plus j or minus j I warn you you are making a mistake this is w n squared the next will be w n to the power 4 not not 3 this is w n 1 2 3 we start with w n squared the next one will be w n to the power 4 that will be plus 1 then w n to the power 6 that will be minus 1 please do not make a mistake what were your second row uh, third row third row is 1 w n square w n 4 w n 6 and so on and so forth because your k is equal to 2 right the next one this will be w n cubed which is j then w n minus 1 then minus j <laughs> do not make a mistake this is w n cubed this is w n 6 then you have w n 9 which is the product of these two 
this you should be able to write without any thought okay you should be able to write and then it becomes very simple so we get g k equal to d4 d4 then the samples of g of n which are um, i lost them 1 2 0 1 similarly you find hk the same matrix and this matrix multiplication is very easy 1 minus j minus 1 j you multiply by numbers and add them up okay this is much quicker you find out hk and then you find out gk hk and find out yc of n finally Finally, you find out y c of n as one quarter, one quarter d4 star. All right. So all you have to do is wherever minus j occurs, you put plus j. That's all. Wherever <coughs> minus one occurs, you put minus one. <laughs> okay, one 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 j minus 1 minus j 1 minus 1 1 minus 1 1 j no minus j minus 1 plus j multiplied by the samples of g k h k okay whatever the samples are I have lost them but you will see that this computation is much easier to do than writing in the summation form and keeping track of power sub j. Once you write, once you are able to write d4, you are absolutely safe. Okay. The uh, <clears throat> next point is, what is the use of this? What is the use of circular convolution? Well, the use is in computing linear convolution. You can compute linear convolution by using circular convolution. And circular convolution means you don't compute like we did here. If the number of samples is large, you may not be able to compute by hand. You have to take help of computer. And what help? You use DFT. If this number of samples is large, then you take the DFT of both the sequences, multiply them and find IDFT. But how do we carry out linear convolution? In linear convolution, as you know, the number of samples may not be the same, number one. Number of samples in the individual sequences may not be the same. And the total number of samples in the output, that is the linear convolution, is n1 plus n2 minus 1. And therefore, what we do is we apply the same trick that we have been applying so far. We pad zeros. I have, I have enunciated this by means of a slide here, which I will project gradually. Okay. I said I have to compute linear convolution of this sequence, the same, same example. 1, 2, 0, 1 and 2, 2, 1, 1. Then I know that my output shall go from n equal to 0 to 8 minus 1. 7 will be the length. So, it shall go from 0 to 6. Agreed? Or 0 to 7. The length of individual, length of the output shall be 7. Agreed? Yes. And therefore, we must have 7 samples in both the two input sequences. Agreed? If we want to compute by circular convolution, number of samples should be the same. So, I compute how many samples do we require in the output? 7? So, I make both of them 7 by padding zeros. I have 1, 2, 0, 1, then I add 3 zeros. I have 2, 2, 1, 1, I add 3 zeros. 
and compute the circular convolution by any one of the tricks. If the number of samples is large then I shall use FFT. But if the number of samples is manageable like this you see how we can do it by mechanization. Okay? 7 and 7 so the output circular convolution should also have 7 samples. So we go the same way we multiply by 0 all of them are 0. The next one we keep one place vacant again all zeros then the last 0 comes here. Next one two places vacant and I go on doing this okay the same uh, mechanization my final result is here and then to find out which one is my yc of 0 I found out I find out where is hz0 h0 well this column shall give you yc of 0 let me raise it this will give me yc of 0 then 1 2 3 4 5 and you come back this must be the sixth okay so i can compute linear convolution <coughs> by using circular convolution in summary <coughs> in summary we have uh, we have found various methods for computing circular convolution. One is graphical, one is the trick that is the mechanization. Now one of the disadvantages of the mechanization is that you lose track of the physical picture. But for an engineer once you have got the concept you should be able to mechanize it time is important okay and therefore whatever works you have to do it a little carefully in circular convolution as you know you have to identify which column shall give you the 0th sample then everything else is clear okay the trick then we said <coughs> find gkhk and idft of that okay this you can do by two methods by matrix method which appears to be easier okay and the other one is the summation or step by step and finally what else did we do there are four methods now finally we said that linear convolution can also be computed by FFT that is where the importance comes by FFT if you pad sufficient number of zeros to the input sequence to the two sequences which are to be convolved. The number of zeros has to be carefully done so that the length becomes equal to the expected length of the result. Okay? Uh, I think this is a correct point to stop. We shall continue in the next lecture.